Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to Gestalt Poetry Open Mic with Amy Hoskins. I am not Amy, as you can tell, but I have the honor of filling in for Amy, uh, who uh, uh, was dealing with some health issues and she asked me to uh, to, to guest host, which I'm so glad I'm, I'm able to. So I wanna say welcome to you all. Happy Saturday, it's Saturday afternoon here. Uh, Saturday, August 24th, wherever you are on the planet, I hope you're enjoying. So good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good night. Uh, although I think morning is long past for many of us, but I, I hope you had a good sun uh, Saturday, really enjoying the Saturday. It's been a beautiful sunny day here in Toronto. So and it is uh, my pleasure to, uh, to guest host today uh, for Amy. So uh, just before we get started, I uh, just want you to know uh, uh, just a little bit of news. Uh, uh, our next feature will be September 28th when we get to feature another brilliant poet, Henry L. Jones. Uh, for those of you that do know, please uh, remember, uh, if you're looking for any information with regard to future events uh, that Gestalt Poetry puts on, you can find it on uh, Amy's website, amyhoskins.com. And also you can find her, her new chat book, uh, the semblance of equal grace that's also on uh, on her website where you can uh, uh if you're so inclined uh, follow the link and, and and support her so anyway i'm glad to see you here like i said i got up on the right side of the dirt this morning so that's a good thing so I'm, otherwise we'd be having a whole different conversation so but today us poets have gathered to celebrate another brilliant poet and today we get to feature Laura Gravel. Many of you are very familiar with her, have seen her before, but it's always great when you get a moment to, to, to have a poet put together a nice set where we can really dive into their work other than one or two pieces. So just a little bit about uh, Laura. Originally from Texas, uh, she's lived in Europe for the past 24 years. While <clears throat> While trip, uh, tripping through various countries, Laura has become a, a performance poet, fiction writer, and a blogger. Her writings are eclectic, tackling the immigrant experience, politics, storytelling, and nature. Her work has been published widely, including recently in Steel Jack Law, uh, Mayawi uh, Literature, Panic's Collective Anthology, Volume 1, Poetry Salzburg Review, and Finn Hall's Unite the States of America. Laura loves the international poetry community, and she has often and she often reads online at various open mics and events. Please review her poetry performance on her YouTube channel. And um, I'm assuming after she's finished, she'll put all her particulars where you can find out how to reach out if you don't know her. If you don't know her work or where to find it. And also just take an opportunity to reach out to her and maybe have a conversation with her outside of, of, of this gathering. But ladies and gentlemen, I invite you for just a brief moment to just unmute so we can snap it up. We can clap it up. We can whoop hey, it up hey, hey, for our feature poet this month, Laura yeah. Griffin. Hey, Laura. Let me just, all right, there you go. Thank you so much, Raul. I'm honored and delighted. Thank you, Amy, and thank you all for all you've done to organize this and to help uh, and for inviting me. And uh, thank all of you for coming. I've, I'm, I'm amazed and delighted. And uh, tonight I have a, a special trip for you. I'm going to take you on a journey to Italy. First, we're going to Sicily because in 2008, friends invited us to visit them there. So recently we went. And here, this first piece is titled after one of the major cities. It is called Catania. After dark, the people of lava walk the streets in Mount Etna's black dust, walk 
in Etna's fire, in a city of Baroque exuberance, crumbling decay's smile, its molten ambition. Where the train station fountain frames the roaring rape, Pluto seizes Proserpina, where witnesses, women and horses, boast sublime blank stares at the nearby cafe, where sit the chic, blind, young, umanjano, sushi and barbecue in sunglasses, while signs shout, the Lido swallows sun worshippers, who range naked on waves of staked pleasure as the homeless hunch silent in the grass graves wearing bare need. After dark, the cathedral casts shadows of perfection on a land that's seen earthquake eruption and flow that balances religion on a tourist's meal deal, watching that no one steals communion wafers, the Jesus favors that save souls in a fragile business the West advertises by fire sale. Holy mass held together by Pope Francesco's smile. While barefoot on hot cobbles, the people of lava walk after dark, past the priests riding mopeds, past the virgin's high-held selfie stick, the black-eyed baby girls in matching flowered smocks, the Africans selling trinkets, the racing bike taking flight, the many skirts that cluck, the old man whose hands speak clinched means near a monastery of nuns whose weak sees prayers manifest like fried eggs. Where after dark, the people of lava walk, gathering their Greek beginnings with lime and limoncello, with the bitters of an island that swum in place for thousands of years, that knows war and peace melt in lava flow, that knows bets are off when Etna smokes white puffs, that drought is Sicily's poker face. So that was Catania and the next Peace. We're going to the southern point of Sicily, and um, that's a little city called Pozzallo, and this piece is dedicated to a girl named Gaia. In Pozzallo, you will meet the girl with honest eyes in the village of Pozzallo. The sea shines through those eyes. The sea shines always in Pozzallo. You will walk along the sandy beach in Pozzallo. You will walk through wind and heat. The sun shines through those eyes. The sun shines always in Sicilia. The eyes will walk across the waves in Pozzallo. The eyes will walk across the sky. The sky flies in those eyes. The sky flies always in Pozzallo. The oleanders bow and bloom in Pozzallo. The oleanders live without care. The century cactus flowers tall in Pozzallo. The centuries always stand tall. You will meet the girl with, with honest eyes in Pozzallo, near the Torre Cabrera 500 years ago. The tower stands in those eyes. The tower stands always in Pozzallo. You will meet the waves where pirates tried. You will meet the wind of pirates. 
defeated easily by the eyes of Pozzalo, by the honest eyes of Pozzalo. The next piece is a tribute to my husband because while in Sicily, we celebrated 30 years together. And this is called, I Will Confess. The word for wordle that day was scone or shone, but what was the question? To see or not to see? When you returned from the Sicilian beach yesterday, my love, from saving that kid from the scary grape in the sand, I should have fallen down and kissed your dita, because Italians know what's what. And next time you raise your voice because you're tired and we're getting old and you were all your life a little afraid, I should shine you a soft smile, give you a scone and continue watering the cabbage. Because how many marathons and battles must we challenge ourselves with in this life? If you can save a screaming child from a disguised grape, then I should be able to remember that I've loved you across continents and that you deserve the love of mountains. So many times I have failed in this regard, but I will kiss your dita, all of them, and we will talk of children and cabbage and even kale with the reverence of a pair who've survived 30 years together, five countries that padded and swatted us, four children who've grown to spread wordle. And I will confess that I will always want another hug. My cabbage is full. Ti amo, mio amore. And just to let you know, dita is the plural, fingers and toes. Okay, and now in this, in this journey of geography and memory, um, which is, a, as you see, a, a personal journey in a way, um, we will go back in time to 2007 when my family and I lived in Verona, Italy for one year. Um, and so these pieces will tell you about that. From Verona, where we knew no one, we would walk up into the hills past the syringes and dog feces on ancient paths walled by high stone, where we came upon farms <clears throat> with vineyards and orchards, oleanders blooming pink and red, barking dogs tied to trees. <clears throat> and at the crests of the hills, we looked out past the old nunnery to see below the veil of Piccola Avesa and beyond the valley of La Grande Città, with her buildings shining like gemstones in brown murk. And the hill air was just a little, a little better, and the breeze called us by name, and we were free. And other times, we rode our bikes out of town, rode past the abandoned house where work had stopped 25 years before, and we wondered if they refused to bribe someone. That's why. And we passed the little farms with vineyards and vegetable gardens and rode out to the woods of robber Hots and Plots. We named it that after a mean robber from a children, a German children's book. And our children were scared of robbers as we walked the paths through woods young and thin. And we wondered where the big old woods went. 
and we knew no one there, for we were strangers. But we caressed the creek gurgling through, and we took the thin woods, held it against our chests, and loved it to bigness. The robber ran away. A little town, village that was on the edge of Verona was called Avesa, which was mentioned in the previous one. And the next piece is the chapel at Avesa. Per favore il chiave della piccola chiesa. The man smiles crustily. The ancient key opens the door to the smell of prayers. Soft, sharp, piercing, poignant, burnt. 1100 years of prayers swim, crowd, swoon in that square plain room. 1100 years of prayers stand and bow their heads, sweep a hand across their brow, ponder faded frescoes. 1100 years, light a candle, expand with breath, kneel and genuflect. 1100 years, collect tears, exhale with sighs, stare at the floor, wipe dust from a knee. Hear my plea, repeat my hope for my mother who will die in two years. So now we come to um, a longer piece and the final piece, which uh, tells a lot about our life in, in Verona. I'm gonna have to make this slightly smaller because my text doesn't fit on the page. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is called, Do You Want to Hear the Truth? about our year in Italy. Do you want to hear the truth about our year in Verona? To hear about waiting in line at La Questura, the police station, sitting on the curb on the highway, holding my toddler and two children, missing their school day as trucks race by, spewing fumes and dust waiting with other foreigners, Poles, Romanians, boat people, indignant Swedes, spending hours eating that poisonous cocktail of hope and desperation and nothing happening. Sweating one day, freezing another once a month, an unholy appointment to request visas from a bureaucrat waiting for a bribe we never gave. Do you want to hear the truth about where we lived? Our nice apartment in a nice part of town, the red tiled floor, the five balconies, the city heat that no matter the cold, turned on November 1st and off March 31st. The insidious dust that accumulated all over our apartment and every apartment in that city every three days. Dust of road, cars, dog poop, pesticides, our neighbors' disapproval, the bangs on our ceiling from their stomps at our music. Well, up on floor three lived the aging woman who always complimented my daughter's flute playing and commiserated about the unfriendly second floor resident. On floor four, the pleasant, handsome mafia member who always worked a lot at his garage down below. And on floor six, the elegant teacher, Matilde Dalgoca, who kept inviting us to coffee and cake. 
those six floors of 10 families glued together by politeness and concrete and lack of choice. Do you want to hear the truth about the air? How our three-year-old began to cough in November, how our eight-year-old couldn't ride his bike, how they coughed and coughed and the dottoressa helped us, though the Italian bureaucracy had still not processed our visas nor my husband's EU passport, how the dottoressa said in perfect English, You've seen the children in the waiting room. They all have the cough. It's the pollution. They will all have it through winter. There is nothing we can do. Do you want to hear the truth of why we moved there? that we left Austria to escape the cold and my health problems, to live a dream, and because we had a friend named Alberto. We met him through our horse farming connection. He helped us settle in and he lived the dream as perfect as he could be in an imperfect world. He farmed with horses, to be ecologically correct, to live for the love of farming and those great strong beasts of work. And he and his wife ate no meat, no sugar, no salt, no dairy, no alcohol. And he was polite, sexist, religious, and insightful. He said, Nothing is achieved in Italy these days except by individual initiative. Do you want to hear the truth about the schools? How the crowd of families delivering children gathered each morning, the parents and grandparents bringing them and waiting in theatrical anticipation. The teachers coming out and claiming their students and leading them in, in pairs, like a grand parade. And there were no sports at all. The playground was mostly dirt. The children above seven years not allowed to run on the meager grass because there was no money to water, to landscape, to repair the building that was peeling and cracking. Yet organic food was served for lunch and the fine arts were taught. And each day after eight hours of school, the children were brought out to the same waiting crowd of cheering families on bikes and in fancy cars to take the children home. Do you want to hear the truth about me? How my husband and I lay at night on our bed and punctually at midnight heard the city bus headed our way, the lights piercing between the metal window shades, the rumble pushing like a wave against the wall, the bad us threatening to break through and reminding that soon we'd again trek to La Questura to stand in line this time with only the northerners as complaints had resulted in the separation of African boat people from Europeans. To wait for hours again, to finally speak to a surly clerk, to try not to lose control and shout to leave, having accomplished niente. And when I heard we had to leave, I wept at the loss of the beautiful language of ciao and salve and buongiorno come state. The warmth of friends' smiles and kisses, the faces of their children, of the proud, handsome, decaying houses, the ancient stone paths and walls, the bridges and churches, the red and white striped brickwork of Palazzo Vecchio, 
the medieval gardens of Giusti, the old exhausted river Adige, the crumbling opera arena, the piazza Erbe and Bra with the vendors hawking tourist goods, the glitz of the old city boutique street, the cobblestones, the bravado of everyone and sports clothes, the pride and serenity of a white clothed woman holding an umbrella while bicycling down the street in the rain. The grace of Alberto driving his team of horses across a field of red poppies. Thank you very much. Mille grazie. Oh, wow. Grazie, grazie, grazie. I feel like we just experienced oh. the uh, poetic opera touched on all the great dra dramas of life from the happy to the tragic what an amazing set you know i've i've, I've experienced you before but i'm sitting here in, in in a in a different space i think you did six pieces from the drought was sicily's poker face the sentries always stand tall in palermo you deserve the love of mountains i love that line I've loved you across continents. We caress, <clears throat> we caress the creeks gurgling through the smell of prayers. That's just a brilliant line. The smell of prayers. And that poisonous cocktail of hope and desperation. I could have added a whole lot many lines, but oh my gosh, that was just... Brilliant. That was a poetic opera that we just experienced. Thank you so much, Laura. What say you, our village? What say you? Unmute for a second. Let her know how you feel. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Oh. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Just one Amazing. So much oh. Completely transported. Oh. Thank you, Laura. The you speak. Oh, so amazing. Bravo, <laughs> bravo. Oh, wonderful. No, that's just wonderful. Oh. I'm actually looking Laura. forward to going back and reading the comments because I didn't even want to read comments of people. I just mm -hmm. wanted to just be focused on what you were saying. I can only imagine what the comments are. About. Yeah, I just put the word brilliant. Because <laughs> I thought that would yeah. cover everything. Yes. Breath, yes. Breathtaking, breathtaking. Absolutely. Yes, most definitely. Mm. Something really organic about, mm. about your work. Mm -hmm. There's something so comedic about it as it well. There's a lot of tragedy in it. There's a lot of tragedy in it. But there's something quite comedic. It's like you are taking, you have a, it's like a wicked sense of humor you have underneath a lot of things that you're saying. You know, it's almost like you, uh, sardonic. You're like a sardonic Joe of your mm. laughings. Mm. They're <laughs> dreadful mm. because it's the only way to sort of treat it and as well as sing it. It was really, it really was pantomime at its best and opera at its best combined. Yeah. I probably won't call it poetry. I'll call it Law's State of the Union message. It's just gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> and well, Laura, you know, the place that you read from, <clears throat> I mean, I could hardly breathe at times. You just so fully inhabit the feelings and the images. Just adding that to content of the poems just over the moon laura wow. well happy uh new rotation 30 30 rotations to you and your hubby and i feel like we just experienced uh 30 years of your trek across the continent with your family right your work was just so descriptive so honest mm. so heartfelt Full of life. It's as if you're like a 14 year old girl reading poetry about a whole world travel that you've done. <laughs> you know? It's like you don't, the way you come across is not, and I don't mean to say you look like an old woman because that is not what you look like, but it's all, it's so young. You haven't lost your the vitality of youth. And it comes across very, very powerfully. And I think that is great because sometimes you hear people of a certain age reading poetry and it sounds like their age. 
Yours does not. <laughs> and I, I, I take my hat off to you for that. Thank you all so much. Laura, I, I'm just, just going to say, it's like, um, so I haven't been doing many Zooms, but like, you know, I thought, God, I miss you. <laughs> Oh, guys, <laughs> sometimes it's so, so much in life what you're missing, and then you you that Laura, absolutely. Uh, 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 you know, I ain't turned on just to support you, but you didn't need support. <laughs> um, absolutely. Oh, um, uh, yeah. Uh, hope to see you soon. What a way to. Uh to spend time together as humans, to listen to another amazing human, to dazzle us with, with her creativity, her brilliance, her honesty, her vulnerability, and to share your family the way you did, right? To share your family, and the family is, is, is part of, is a character in your poems, but so is, so is your love of, of living in, in Europe, right? You could feel it. And the disappointments, you know, that's life, good and bad, right? The good and bad of it. So well done, my friend. Well done. Well you. done. Right. Now you get to sit back and enjoy these amazing other poets that came in honor of you today and in honor of Amy. Because Amy, this is this is your show. I'm just I'm just filling your seat today. I'm so glad I could do this. So you know, and and yeah, so you know, I got goddess bumps. Just it won't stop, right? Now. I'm just hiding, right? Now. So, you know, I do I my own show, and I'm feeling this is long. even more than my show. Oh, sorry, I'm what was that, Joan? I said I don't know what I'm doing either. I'm just going with the flow. <laughs> And, and, I, and, and I think from now on, anytime someone needs to give a critique, we need to get Joan to do it because <laughs> of the accent and the way you do it. It's just brilliant. And, uh, excuse uh, me, Raul, Raul, do you want me to watch the room now, from now? Well, if you like, sure. I'm, uh, yeah. If you want me to help with that, I can. Yeah, if you want, you, you let me know because, I mean, we're kind of, we're out, not kind of, we're co-hosting. So if you want to also do some introduction, let me know. But, you know, I'll start off. Hmm? Sorry? I'll, I'll just I'm happy to watch the room and, and okay. drink tea <laughs> to hold my throat. I, 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 I myself know. want you to just bask in this because you're, oh, okay. you're just it the words but that you, know the words that we've all shared here does not truly capture, I think, what we just experienced. And we've all been to various Zoom rooms and we've seen others. And it's not that I'm not trying to put any one person above, but for this moment and this time, right now, what we just experienced is hard to even capture in words. And there's been some brilliant words spoken, but that's just how In God's region, we call a belter. <laughs> a belter. Belta. When something's yeah, extraordinary yeah. or it stands above its other peers or whatever, or, or other, other <clears> group <throat> meetings or whatever, you go, oh, that's a belter. <laughs> Whoa. That's, that's a little bit higher. I have not heard that word in a long time, Joan. Thank you for that. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, we'll let her enjoy her tea and uh, and hopefully you'll get a chance to, to check out some of the comments. And now we'll start the open mic part. Um, I will post uh, 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 who we have uh, signed up for the open mic. Uh, if we've missed you for some reason, please let us know. We do have a very long list just to goes to show the popularity of, of not just uh, uh, Amy, but uh, a featured poet. Many people wanted to be here today. So I will invite you poets to please try to keep your comments short. Um, maybe keep it to, to, to two poems at the most, but we do have well over 20 poets that want to recite tonight. And I, I want, we want to obviously honor everyone that, that has mm -hmm. signed up. So, all right. So I'd like to call first to the mic, the actual host of the Open Mic Poetry. Like I said, she's feeling better, but not quite there yet. So uh, I think it's only fitting that we start the open mic section with Amy uh, sharing. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you, Raul and Laura, for taking on the gestalt duties for the month. That really has helped me so much. I've been in really rough spirit. So it's really been helpful that you guys did that. Really appreciate that. I have two small poems that I've written since the surgery somehow. <laughs> okay, the first one's called Postcard from Space. 
imperfect glowing skin the filling orb sky tints venetian clouds lofts close new cathedrals with the double blue moon vascular glittering universe carl sagan would be proud of what we now see in space nebula black holes heat of x-rays gamma sun rays birthing baby stars from the floating mountain pillars of creation ancient wings of time enfolding our bones i love you sleeping beside me as the old click old clock ticks etymology of leaves is ever changing growing into language from the sounds we made dreams woven with photons of our mutual attraction the poetry returns a curated chiffonade of feelings metal bone flesh the postcard stained with its inky travels philatelic fans admire the stamp from greece you travel back in time from barcelona the coast of france you send a photo of a tower there i send one back from downtown nashville complete with frank sinatra sign you found a portal a deep red color expanded your world brought it home nurturing your dreams <laughs> thank you and this is a really short one called tantric the old feelings opposite now shame bottomless guilt stick to my insides like burnt wood i can't shed emotional scars tantric just the same in bits sparks of miraculous joy seeds you the magic life beside me on this island spinning in a treacherous sea we wonder that we are still alive kisses to inspire share love itself imminent moments full of light lift us from the pit of the stomach mantras like i love you all that you do all that you are being with you all i desire sit beside me let's ride the waves to the end of this movie <laughs> thank you yeah, i'm gonna do my best to not uh talk too much after <laughs> there's, there's so many lines in there that i just love thank you and you. i have to figure out a way that i could feature you on my show I would love that. Thank you. Because I, well, I do it on Sundays. I know Sundays before you and hubby, but we got to figure something out. Because I, I will. I'll try to make it. <laughs> <laughs> I love your approach. I just love it. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Amy. I'm glad you're feeling better. Glad you're on the mat. So, all right. Yeah. This is why on my show, I always go from brilliance to brilliance because, I mean, I'm surrounded by a sea of brilliant hum humans, and they just happen to be poets. So, up next, Suzanne, speaking of uh, brilliant poets. Thank you, Raleigh. You're most welcome. Wow, what an event this is. Um, okay, I have two. This first one is called Yes with Abandon. The stiff-spined, bossy mother at the table next to us instructing her kids to be cheerful and polite clenched my jaw as I did when I was ordered to douse my fires, stomp on the beast, stop moping, smile, turn that frown upside down, she said. I'd obey or else. You're free now, little me. Years to untangle from the plans that were never yours. No is a favorite word for us, and we don't have to say it nicely. Yes is whole being rightness, stung and danced with abandon. And the second one is called This Bowl. The glass bowl on my desk, gentle leaves floating in clear water, radiating contentment with what is. A healthy family, knowing, 
how to be love, how to be deep stillness, when to come together, when to float alone, who to connect with, when and how to help a beloved in need. Contemplating them, I slip into being them. Then the phone. On call, doctor, getting back to me. Keep a close eye on the wound, she said. I spoke my wound story, the wound trauma that still haunts, hoping she would include some empathy with her advice. Told her that I get nauseous and tense. My jaw freezes every time I look at this new, raw lesion. Follow the aftercare instructions. Go to the ER if it doesn't improve by tomorrow. I spin back to the last Lansing procedure, the shaking, shivering, desperate for a hand to squeeze or someone to care about the pain and awfulness. Now, again, no words of comfort, no warmth, no feeling. I have my marching orders, I say, cold, impersonal, silence, both of us, goodbye, hot anger, fear, tears. When I land in the silence, after a time, I hear, go to the bowl, turn to the lead, you are family. The caring kindreds brushed the outline of my body until the tension dissolved into the water. What a loving family does. More tears. I remember how mom just couldn't. Her own wounds too raw and deep to see or feel the depth of my pain and me too frozen to let her fully see. I have leaves now and trees, rivers and heartful kindreds. Feels like is a new life. Ease, trust, love. This bowl of floating leaves. This bowl of being. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Beautiful as usual. Beautiful as usual. All right. So we have Waiting in the Wings, Millie. And up next, we have uh, Maya. You have the mic. Uh, Maya? I said Maya. Maya, I mean. You are muted, my friend. Okay. There you are. There you are. Okay, I'm going to read now, but it's uh, two fifteen in the night out here, so I will be leaving in a short while. It's okay. I hope you'll understand. Of course, you do. So the first poem is called "Adventure," and it's an old poem. It was written a few, couple of years ago. Uh, in, the incident happened several years ago, but the poem was written about three, four years ago. Clouds drift beneath my feet, obscuring the town underneath. The vista makes me feel so grand above rooftops, clouds, trees, and dam. I feel the thrill of height, pretend I'm an empress commanding everything in sight. Then a snake glides by silently twisting its tail menacingly. The long black snake strikes fear in my heart, warning me not to think too smart. Like him, I'm alone on the mountain top. Unlike him, my heartbeat stops. Can I escape his poisonous pines? Run for my life till I reach flat land? The height that made an empress of me, now mocks my apparent frailty. 
face to face with a snake. My legs quiver and shake. Panic drives me to irrationality. Relief that my clothes match the scenery. Green and black, grass and stone. If I'm part of the landscape, will he leave me alone? He's sunning on a rock near a people tree. Still as a snick, stick, he hasn't seen me. He's camouflaged, black on grey. Only the swishing tail gives him away. Creech! Sudden huge flapping wings scatter the air in turbulent rings. Sharp, uncurled, savage claws close around the dreaded jaws. I gape in awe as an enormous bird carries my nemesis, becomes my saviour. I see the snake writhing in air, then only the bird, making guttural sounds rarely heard. Somehow I manage to stumble downhill, still stunned by the amazing spectacle. I turn around to touch safe ground, thank the universe for being around. And the second poem is a shorter one. It's from my recent collection, uh, Can Poetry Halt War? And uh, this is towards the end. It's a search for peace. It's called Despite War. Despite heaps of rubble on every street, Flowers continue their summer bloom, peeping white, pink, yellow, maroon in pervading gloom. Despite drones dropping bombs causing death, fire, fumes, each evening rises a radiant moon, carrying light of a soon-to-be-born sun. Despite dark nights, fireflies sparkle Flitting from wall to window pane, their on off light brings dry smiles, diverting hearts from constant pain. Yes, we can surmount the war madness with nature's agents of healing. Hang on to precarious sanity despite our hearts pleading. Thank you. <clears throat> well done, my friend. Thank you so much. And and please don't don't apologize if you have to leave early. I know it's late for you. So and any any of you poets, if you have to leave, or whether you're not feeling well or whatever, you don't have to apologize. But I do appreciate the sentiment. So thank you so much for your 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 brilliance as usual. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Up next, uh, we have Millie and waiting in the wings. We have uh, Ben Venue, who uh, Ben Venue. Hopefully, he's here. So, but Millie, you have uh, the mic. Is Millie here? Okay, maybe. Millie, are you here? I he's thought... here. I, yeah, I thought it's oh, there you are. Okay. Can you hear? Yes, we can. Am I audible? You. Yes, we can hear you well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Good evening to all of you. Uh, nice to meet you. Too. So, uh, now I am going through my poem. Sorry, sorry. My first poem, name of the poem, We Want Justice. How long will we, will it be patience? We we'll still be persecuted. We we'll scream in the name of freedom. Is it really freedom? 
Every woman are unprotected. We are oppressed by the society's greed, laws, vile, satanic glee, rule and exploitation. Is the brutal tyranny ever called freedom? The girl is screaming, can you hear? The girl is writhing in pain, can you hear? The girl wants to lie, can you hear? The girl wants to save many people, can you hear? She wanted to come to behind the curtain. She wanted to see the morning glow. Where is sympathy? Where is compassion? Which civilization we are living in? The birds are falling. The flowers don't bloom. No one opens mouth to save her life. The dream is dying. After so many years of India's independence, we, the girl, really been able to be independent. Have we really got freedom? You have answered, honorable minister. We want justice. Let us die to this brutal rapist. This was my first poem. And my second one is Mother, the name of India's love. My divine mother, you are the greatest warrior in this world. You are incomparable to anything in this world. I lost you. I can't explain without you how I am feeling now. Now I can understand. There is nothing in this world as beautiful as mother. Without you, I am turning 11 years. Like you, no one cares me. To all the people who lost their mother, remember, no one can ever take her place in his life. She never wants to you to be sad. Mom, I miss your unconditional love, which gives me strength. I can see you. You are here by my side. You are only one who can sacrifice her entire life for the family. You used to tell me I'm strong enough to take the challenges in my life. Now I can realize. I was not prepared myself for the days ahead. Life after you. I'm the kid who has lost her life, who has lost her light, lost her guide, and the best one throughout her journey. I've lost the smell of your body. I've lost the smell of my mother. Uncontrollable tears flowed from my eyes. I found out why I am crying. Every night you come to my dreams, but I can't catch you. Till now I can't describe the fear of feeling, losing my mom. I feel your absence. I miss you each moment when everyone leaves me. I miss you, mom, the best ever soul. This is my promise to God. In the next birth, I'll become your daughter and have you as a mother from my birth, from birth to birth, from birth to birth, from birth to birth. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, um, Lee. <clears throat> Glad to have you here. I know it's late for you as well, so I uh, appreciate your time. All right, up next, uh, I want to call and see if uh, Bienvenue is here, because I don't see him, because I had him next. Bienvenue, are you here? I don't believe you are. If you are, and uh, you answer, I'll put you on the list later. I'm just going to go off track a little, because <clears throat> one of our beloved friends, uh, Finn, has a feature later, and she has to leave, so I'd like to get her on before she uh, has to go do her thing. So, Finn Bell. The mic is yours, my friend. Thank you so much, Raleigh. Good afternoon, poets. Um, I just have two pieces for you. Um, the first one is titled Conifer. 
The coniferous tree in the front yard has no one who she may claim as kin. I noted this one day, taking in the solitary nude fan palm and her eager sprite cousin waving at me three neighborhoods away. The three crone Italian Cypress sisters huddled together, but never more distant, cold, and apart. I understand innately. I understand as woman how to bear the burden of a companion seedling sworn loyal. Is a family a single organism of devotion and sacrifice? Do they carry every unrealized dream firmly within each roughened whorl? The weeping willow, or is she a pepper tree, as free and single as far as she knows, slip showing, dipping below her diaphanous outerwear, red lipstick, pollock frenetic smeared, a daily dawn hour walk of shame. I feel I have known her past incarnations. I feel where we intersected then dissected our past lives. I suppose I could ask the arbor doctor about the pine when he comes by, but I am not given to small talk. I am not easily conversant. Still, I talk this man up, make him redwood mighty. Yet he is not a physician of flora green. He takes down life in its prime when commanded to do so. He asks not questions. He knows not of his sins. I bless and forgive him. I do not ask the Connor for her name. I do not want to know. We do not communicate with each other in the way I divulge my life story with abandon, with glee, to sleek prison bathed native crows as they observe me from fresh tree stumps, and to the citrine bejeweled calliope hummy as she pauses a mere pulse beat to listen. I do not ask the conifer her name. I have found comfort in our companionable silence, in both of us each holding a secret of our own. I know one day soon, I will invite her to join me for coffee in the early morning. I will throw the doors wide open as I let the world inside. I will feel my chest expand, my breath even out as she uncramps history ravaged limb to feel her way along the dim entryway to the bright indifference of a kitchen perpetually in use, but not ever loved nor lived in. Um, the second one is, um, it is uh, inspired by Karen, um, British Malaysian poet, I'm, I'm sorry, British Malaysian artist Karen Ko's Fragments One. Um, and this is dedicated to my mom. It's called Blue. If my mother's country girl dusters wore their homesickness on the outside, they would die and stain her body blue, seep into her bloodstream, a truer, bluer than blue. See here now, a bird bone, golden brown woman, heart pumping indigo through veins and out arteries, each pass a purging, a divergent dilution, a cleansing of history. They would seep out life force fluid and flood the kitchen floor of further shedding of abandoned homeland, an amalgamation of colonized milk, pre-introduced, remixed, parts uneven measure, what is yours is mine, folded in with each stir, each stab, what is ours was never meant for you, for your kind. You see, a mixture is never equal parts. It is invention, ingenuity, adaptation becomes accosting, appropriating, claiming, conquering. If my mother had worn her country girl dusters on the outside, stepped out of doors, sashaying the stars and rays caught in their hands, waved them like wings of a cooped up dove heart stirring, Kumikinang na bandera ng bayan minamahal, bluefield aloft, buoyed for a moment upon the current, the stifling air of land, of the free and the brave, what then would follow? A battle cry singing in a lilting key of illusory peace, 
a bird clad in slow drifting blood sky spangled star bursting stratosphere may still be led astray blinded following the birth and death of a cruel father's son thank you sashaying with stars <laughs> brilliant well done my friend well done thank you for being here enjoy your feature where's your feature tonight is with uh, Avachal um, La Palabra Musical. Yes, uh, I co-feature with four other poets. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, enjoy, enjoy. Thank you so much. Okay, so <clears throat> we have Waiting in the Wings. Nina is Waiting in the Wings. And up next, the Velvet Voice, Ian. <laughs> yes, it follows you wherever you go. <laughs> Thank you, Moses, okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, right. Well, here in the UK, it's Bank Holiday Weekend, and in Reading specifically, there's a Reading Rock Festival going on down the road. So naturally, it was pissing it down all day today. So I ended up that in the coffee shop. I, I wrote this poem. It's called Parallax Views, looking out the window at Cafe Nero's. On a bank holiday weekend, the constant veil of heavy raindrop ripples the gleaming wet roads and pavements, distorting reflections, reducing passing pedestrians to an assortment of L.S. Lowry, matchstick men and matchstick women, wrapped tight in their coats and glossy anorak. Meanwhile, I'm here, warm and dry, at my regular post, looking out at the world through the glazed prism of plate glass window at Cafe Nero on Apex Plaza. This random smattering of shoppers and planners is supplemented today by scattered knots of festival goers taking some tired relief from the horrors of the muddy foot trampled ground down by Richfield Avenue, just here for the heavy beat of rock bands and drum and bass. They are greeted instead by the incessant drumming of this constant deluge of bank holiday rainfall that hangs even heavier from sodden blankets of clouds smothering the gap between the crenellated eye line view of shop roofs and townhouses darkened by rain dampened brick concrete and slippery slabs of slates and craning my neck to look up at this spongy lid of flat gray i am distracted by the hissing drawl of white noise as wet rubber breaks up the surface tension of the black film of water Pulching, shrinking tarmac. And for a brief moment, amongst these subterranean ghosts of passers by, it seems as if looking at life passing by through a parallax view of the world, that if I open one eye and keep the other one shut, things just might come back into kilter. So that's my first one. And this one, I'm dedicating this especially for our good friend who's here tonight, Richard Harris, because uh, I stole the line of his that um, every time Richard finishes the poem and he does a little bit of a spiel afterwards and sort of bring everything to an end, he always comes up with a sort of phrase, well, there you go. And so I uh, worked something out off that. So it's called, well, there you go. The music today is not the same as it used to be in my day. That was such a time ago. It's just another kind of song for a different age. Well, there you go. The kids today are growing up much faster these days than we did so long ago. And the roads are much busier now than way back then. Well, there you go. And they say the weather's warmer now, whereas before it was quite cold. And some who are in the 
snow sets down to climate change while others are in denial. Well, there you go. And the wars are still going on. And when all is said and done, it's not rocket science, you know. If you keep giving people guns, the killing will just keep going on. Well, there you go. Thank you. <clears throat> brilliant, my friend. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. As always. All right. Thank you for being here as usual. Um, so we have, <coughs> excuse me, we have Joan in the wings and right to the mic. I would like to call Nina to the mic. Hello. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you all. Um, my first poem, I'm going to do two short ones. It's uh, the first one's a found poem created using the the, the messages on protest placards uh, that people used for recent anti-racist marches uh, and some of the t-shirts they were wearing as well, some of the messages on that. Um, there is strong language. Am I allowed to swear? <laughs> there's a little bit of, there's, you know, I'm quoting, so. <laughs> okay, it's untitled as yet. Um, let me just bring it up. We'll trade racists for refugees. Protest is progress. The enemy arrives by limousine, not by small boats. Why is it so dangerous being black? Islam equals peace, phobia equals fear. So are you scared of peace? Laundry should be the only thing separated by color. Black lives have always mattered. Hi. Don't be a racist. Thanks. I'm Muslim. Don't panic. Hands off my hijab. Fascists not welcome here. No to Islamophobia, no to hate, no to racism. I can't believe we still have to protest this shit. Wake up and smell the racism. No justice, no peace, no to Farage, no to racism, no to hatred. If you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. Make racists afraid again. Fuck you, Farage. I bite racists. Picture of shock. It's a privilege to learn about racism, then experience it your whole life. Racism is small dick energy. Free Palestine, smash the racists, I'm not racist, I'll race anyone. Don't make me use my teacher voice, you asshole. Thank you, that's the first one. Uh, sorry if that upset people. Well, it would upset racists. But, um, and my second one um, is called Recipe for Cooking a Poem. Hold a few sparse ingredients in your mind, then toss them onto the page. Pick out the plump ones, the pulp ones, the gift ripe ones. Pluck the corn from the husk, then toss onto a new page. Watch them jostle, marinade, lie still. Stir them a while, play with them, mold them, keep them alive. Sometimes sparks may fly, other times a gentle bubbling. Simmer for a day or two, then cast a fierce eye over the result. They say a good poem always yields a particular scent of knowingness. Like the skin on hot chai protects what lies beneath, it gives itself for nourishment on spare humpback days. It won't be to everyone's taste, it doesn't matter. Some people like truffles, others prefer toast. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, thank you. Well done, well done. To answer to your first poem, we want to end racism, stop believing in race. There's one race on this planet, it's called human. There's no black, white, Chinese, whatever. That's a creative creation. You want to end racism, stop believing in race. Thank you so much for sharing, thank you. All right, so we have... Neil, you are in the wings, and Joan, the mic is yours. 
Thank you. Yeah. Hello, everybody. I've totally enjoyed everything I've heard tonight. So many tangents off, and it's, it's great. It's great. Um, I was very surprised to actually get in this book. It's the 2024 National and International Goddess Anthology, Honouring Women. This is called Sappho's Sister. <clears throat> Sappho, Sappho, tense muse, tense muse, poetess in distress, red blood dripping from archaic dress. I'll write of it. I'll sing of it. As Sappho's heart, badly treated, is in Sappho's mind mess. All of that along with my heart sore, I will address. Only love can save Sappho now, a love that cannot exist. I change fist to bone to bow, to gun, to bomb, for all the Sappho's from Sappho wombs, twist thick red wool with anointed leather, add to twist a raven's feather, Sappho's incantations to her many moons, bring forth from her other worldly tunes, these song poems are for evolved ears as I again attempt not to disappear and to stop the flow of Sappho's tears. The gods are deaf. Sappho's song poetry mingled with her breath goes unheard except by reaper death. Sappho's song poetry danced by death ballet dancers with broken limbs, dark pinball bounces off deathly things. Dark creatures fly above with torn black wings. The fates are here and clearly announce. Sappho's not of this time, nor of this place. She belongs somewhere of magic power and grace. A sister Sappho and I with same eyes do cry. Breaths turning into sigh, uprises from underworld, an incredible creature, strong in body, muscle honed, naked show of middle bone, and not human face of handsome chiseled feature. My sister Sappho and I partly cease our weeping, as in seeing through this creature's eyes. We see all human lies, also writ in tattoos over creatures' body and thighs. In poetry, hieroglyph only poets can decipher. His gentle telepathy lets us know in this time and past and future, he could never be a poet butcher. Something else he lets us feel, love. And that love is real. And this creature's work is to help and heal those poets discarded by people of poets standing who go about promoting their own po poetry branding. The creature told Sappho and her sister of today, although brand poets might have their day, they lack love foundation, despite all marked wordplay. After teaching Sappho and her today sister how to deal with brand poets who cause tight shoe, poetry, soul blister, Mr. Underworld creature, who was the kindest teacher to Sappho and her sister from whence he came, Sappho and her sister, strengthened by underworldly love and sacred knowledge, decided in this time and place not to enter cold poet spaces where they always see the same old faces, so will keep their words and poetry away from torn faces. Search poet places of the mystic, find love and extol.
divine graces. One more to go. This is, if you might be able to feel, it's got a feeling of like the Simon and Garfunkel song. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Hello, poetry, my old friend. It's only you I have now to talk to again. I feel you pushing aside depression. I feel you telling me to hold on, use you for my confessions and the rivers of dark and sadness in my brain rise to battle you again, push me down into my bed like a mimicry of death. Mm -hmm. This lack of energy from the poisons zapped into me that stopped me dying, although I'm glad of. Have me crying, I can do nothing Nothing, nothing to raise my spirits, to help me feel alive again, be myself again, go out walking again, go out talking again, to feel normal again. And the passions in my soul now, so weak and dormant, that I know don't mean to torment, but they do, but they do. And they keep me in my bed, away from life, away from you. What use are any flowers to me now? What use are clothes to me now? What use are perfumes? Will they or other things like them give me the life energy I need back to live in normalcy, my life? These are the things of the old life before cancer therapies were blasted into my body with hormones too. Now my old energy exists in memory. Seabed wrecks can be human. I choose water. I once went zooming through it as a champion. At that time, energy was once tumoring to propel me to finishing lines first. Different tumor, different day. I'm using my energy to express of that tumor distress away today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joan. I'm not sure if I've heard you before, but I really enjoy that. Really enjoyed those two pieces. Thank you. Love to hear more of your stuff. Love to hear more of your stuff. All right. Thank you. So uh, we have Waiting in the Wings, Neymar, and up to the mic, Neil. Thank you. Going to share um, two poems. Silhouette. You wrote a song. How the inspired heart gifts joy, like watching that summer in the back seats of the cinema, the soundtrack, your chords deploy, even now you're gone, your lyrics croon from the abyss, a looping musical déjà vu, wide-eyed seams on Manzan Beach, bungalowed blithely, lost in speech, immortal, alas, not me and you, let it eternal in your clouded opus. Thank you. Mm. A bird in two hands. I have felt the pulse 
from Tangiers to Urzezet in the rise and fall of clay peaks and valleys, ribbons of honey dancing on the periphery in rhythm with my own buoyantly beating back. I have laid back as you leaned in beguilingly, exalted in the dawn of your eyes, dusk's shadows speckled on my thighs, welcoming the breadth and depth of you, smilingly. I have marveled at your vivid threads embroidered into a foreign fabric, like a nuanced nomadic maverick, a tapestry of blue and white and green and red, making my lips seated at tables or on the floor, dipping bread as one with our hands as we eat. Trevor McDonald's voice on the news, somberly replete, and felt your kinship kindled within my core. I have known your affection in the instance of recognition, the communion in one tongue, as your breaths fill the lungs, each enamored by the other, drunk on a familiar potion. I am the wren who flew to the ancestor's place, only to be seduced by Maghreb skies to succumb to her spellbinding sighs, dressed in Monsieur's streaked red star tails. Thank you. Thank you, Neymar. Thank you so much. Always good to hear you. It's been a little while, so I always enjoy when I get to hear you. Hey, Laura, how are you feeling? Are you uh, are you basking still or enjoying all the poetry? I'm enjoying the poetry. If you need me to do something, I will. Oh, no, I'm, I want you to just, I just want you to take it all in. We're good. Okay. We're flowing. I'm taking We're it flowing. all in. There, there was a petrified moment a couple of hours ago, but I, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing well. <laughs> I'm doing enjoying that. Okay. So we have, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, we have waiting in the wings in the green room, Robert uh, Punton, and I like to call to the mic right now, Richard Harris. Thank you. <clears throat> You're welcome, my friend. Uh, my first one, differences. The beard was long, so long, white and grisly, hanging firm, and six inches down from the chin. It separated and hung down in two parts, making the old man's visage seem long, so long, his face so old. He lay asleep on the grass bank, and a bird, a wren, landed. It pecked at the wiry hair, then discontented flapped its wings and tried to fly away, but to its distress could not take off its tiny, taloned feet, caught fast in the mishmash of the hair. The rock was covered in seaweed, tangled and messy, many varieties, some long, some bulbous, all slippery, wet and slimy. Onto it crawled the crab, small and hungry, looking for nibbles to eat. It found some food and was happy. Eating contented him. He no longer had to hunt. 
he just let the water lap over his shell and rested occasionally, moving slowly. Then a wave lapped over and he was covered with long weed, weed that tangled and trapped him. Neither could move, neither were free, neither had choice, neither were without fear. Endings can vary, they differ and are not fair. Perhaps it is fate, perhaps it is chance. These are two different stories with two different ends. The old man stirred, not yet awake, felt something instinctively attached to his beard. He brushed it fiercely with his strong left hand. He crushed the wren, who died in a second. The crabbit struggled and was getting weak, losing hope and about to give up when a wave came a-cracking and it swept it away. Let it float to freedom and to live another day, a predator itself. These tales of entrapment had such different ends. We never know the future and we never know our end. So do remember to joy, enjoy every day for something with the texture of that beard may enter your life, or you may find yourself with a metaphorical rock. Whichever is yours or mine, make sure your last moments count. Thank you. <laughs> um, and um, Naima, uh, Genevieve wants to record it, so she's recorded one of mine, and she's going to record that one, which is lovely, isn't it? Genevieve Ray, so that's, wow, amazing. Um, and this is another one with a sort of maritime uh, theme. Um, it was a challenge to write about Fiddler's Green, which is this legendary mythical place where seasoned sailors who drown go for eternity. Um, and um, so I'm, a, I'm in the challenge club and, and this is one that came out of that. Um, Fiddler's Green. The wind blew. The sea was no longer blue or green, but grey and black, dark as hell. The waves cracked over the ship. We fought, struggled, tried desperately to survive. In vain. We capsized. I swam in the swirling madness, pulling me under. The ship went down. This was my end. I waited for my life to flash in front of me. It didn't. I drowned. A blackness. Nothing. Nothing at all, until I heard the music, a fiddler playing fast, a dancing jig. I felt joy and saw lightness. Fiddler's green existed, and I was there. Oh, thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah. Such amazing uh, storytelling. Such amazing. No wonder other poets want to recite your stuff. So thank you so much, my friend. Glad you were able to hang in there with us and be in good spirits. So always good to hear you. Always good to hear you. Okay. So we have, <coughs> excuse me, waiting in the wings. Deidre, you're waiting in the wings. And I'd like to call Robert to the mic. Is Deidre still here? I thought I saw her, maybe she stepped out or... Okay, doesn't look like she's here anymore. All right, Robert. Uh, um, I'm sorry, I was calling Robert to the mic. I'm just good. I just confused myself in front of all of you. I was, okay, let's try that again. Is Robert here? Robert Putton. No, Robert's not here tonight. Robert's not gone. Okay, so Deidre, are you here? As I confused myself, I was looking for her, and I don't see her as well. So if they do come back, I'll I'll get them on. So let's continue on. Uh, Leslie Constable, the mic is yours. Now, Les, yep. I think you're still muted, Leslie. Oh, there I was. 
yammering away. I was muted. You'd think I'd figured it out by now, but anyhow. So anyhow, I'm going to read this poem. It's a, a trifle sad. It's a homage to my brother who died young uh, in an accident. And um, I like it because it captures the very magical side of him. So it's called The Sheltering Sky. It's, um, and I dedicate it to uh, the filmmaker Bertolucci, uh, who made the film uh, from a book. The Sheltering Sky. I am still, and I am but small, and the wind picks up around me. Not moving, I understand something, but only a little, and it is only in the not moving that I understand. The changes are here, and if I am but still, and the winds pick up around me, the not moving moves me, and I am moving, and I understand. I am moving and begin to spin like the air above me, and I am, and my feet move, and I begin to dance, and the changes are coming, and I am still yet moving all the while, and the electric air is the messenger of the changes, and I am listening, and but still. I dance. If I am still and the winds pick up around me, it is in the not moving that I understand something. In the dream, I am above and see down like a bird or God. The sky is purple waiting for the rain. It is a simple square, this fence, and inside a field of moving grasses, ample and full, moving grains, perhaps, which dance in the wind, top heavy, moving against and with the wind like a coy lover. Can I cross over to the other side and be there? Or this time, am I just watching like God? I wait because I do not know. I will know or maybe I won't, but not this time, not this dream. The ready mud pulls my feet into it, sucks them into the earth and I am caught. I surrender around me, surrounding me in the low spots are pools of water left over from the rains, left over like food not eaten, not taken in, not absorbed by the ready earth. Like so many tears cried and caught by the pockets of earth beneath me to well up at my feet. Tears shed and squeezed out of tired eyes, tears shed like snakeskin to renew my faith in spring. The internal faith in that it will go on even without me and not in my presence. It goes on forever and this is good and I am not afraid this time and it is good to cry in the pools are the underneath of clouds the reflection of clouds and I'm not sure what I am seeing the upside down world the reverse the other side it is the sky above the sheltering sky reflected in the pool of water below the mirror of the clouds and below that the mud if I look hard if I concentrate what is it that I see really? If I squint my eyes and try hard enough, can I see through these pools, this illusion of pools to the other side? Or is it only the mirror of clouds and sky, the underneath of clouds? It was my brother who, laying on his back, watched the underneath of clouds for hours and imagined and talked what he imagined he saw to me. And sometimes he sang and never danced. And one day went into the other side of the pools of water on the ground, in the mud, as part of the mud and part of the sky, and he never came back. That's it for me. Thank you. Oh, Leslie. Always good to hear your, your voice, the, the stories, and then the flow. Love it. I keep promising I'm not going to get into deep or somewhat of an analysis, but I can't help myself sometimes, but I just love hearing your stuff. So, all right, let's continue on. So I will ask uh, Clive to sit in the green room while we call Ike to the mic. Laura, simply incredible. I also stayed in Verona, Catania, Enna, and Palermo. I admit my home is Europe, but my daily chores are American. And for that, I will talk in the stew of politics. Martin 
1892 to 1984. The post-World War II confession by the German Lutheran pastor Martin Niemöller. Niemöller spent eight years in a concentration camp. After World War II, Niemöller openly spoke about his own early complicity in Nazism and his eventual change of heart. His powerful words about guilt and responsibility still resonate today. Let me quote Niemöller. First, the Nazis came to for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then the Nazis came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then the Nazis came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then the Nazis came for me, and there was no one left to speak for, for me. Thus, whenever I ch chance to meet a Jew, I cannot but tell him, dear friend, we cannot get together, for there is guilt between us. I have sinned, and my people have sinned against thy people and against thyselves. The echo of a Martin Niemöller lingers on, especially after the reign of the 45th residence scene. And here I am. I do not register as a Republican because I'm not a Trumpster. Yes, they told me to go home to where I came from. I do not register as an independent because I'm not an activist. I do not register as a Democrat because I do not want to be registered. I am concerned because of legalized political corruption, the core of our demise. I vote because I feel morally obligated. I support the cause of the so-called blacks because I'm not black. I support the cause of the so-called browns because I'm not brown. I support the cause of the so-called Asians because I'm not an Asian. I do, do not agree with the whites because I'm not a white supremacist. I do not believe in Christianity because I'm no Christian. Yes, they told me that I will burn in hell. I do not believe in Judaism because I am no Jew. I do not believe in Islam because I'm no Muslim. I'm not a communist because I believe in a social democracy. I'm not an anarchist because I accept the divine. I am an American because I only see a multiracial society. I am an American because I enjoy a multi-ethnic society. I am an American because I enjoy a multi-religious society. I am an American because my sexual orientation got nothing to do with my capabilities. I became an American and yes, I upgraded to be a Californian. I am an American because I do not have a gun, because I do not need to kill anyone. And then I speak out because history is about to repeat itself. I speak out because I am a concerned citizen. I speak loudly because I am a man. I speak softly because I am human. Thus, whenever I chance to speak to you, I cannot but tell, dear friends, we cannot be divided, for there will be guilt between us. Despite religious and political dogma divided, we will have sinned against us, our children, and our children's children in the eyes of humanity. And here I am, an American Californian,
no offense intended. Thank you. Well done, my friend. Well done. Well done. Good to hear you again. All right, let's continue on. I will uh, like to ask Melissa to sit in the green room and up next to the mic, we have Clive. Hello. Okay, I'm just going to do one tonight. Um, and it's a piece of fast fiction. Brand new. Haven't read it out loud yet. It's very much a first draft. Um, but it's based on real events. I mean, obviously, it's not the true story, but it's based on real events. I was um, traveling to Exeter on the train, and this is based on something that happened on the train. The person I describe is, I actually didn't see them at all because they were behind me. So I've just used a bit of license to describe them by what I thought they sounded like. I had 45 minutes to kill before the train arrived at Ex Exeter St. David's. So inevitably I was going to write. I hadn't felt particularly inspired for a few days, so it was my good fortune when the person in the seat immediately behind me, a blonde, slim woman, probably in her mid-twenties, was talking with a broad southwestern accent on her phone, suddenly exclaimed, Oh, fuck. I didn't mean to do that. I shouldn't have done that. In a tone which suggested an unsuccessful attempt to talk quietly which was followed by a string of, oh, fucking hell, what have I done? Spoken in an increasingly panicky voice and punctuated by silence as the person at the other end presumably reiterated what she'd, know, what she'd known since the first F word jumped out of her mouth. This went on for several miles and, much to my disappointment, it never really became clear what she had done that she didn't mean to do, or perhaps did mean to do, but didn't think it would come to light and was now feigning innocence. With no concrete clues by the time she alighted, still muttering curse words at Taunton, I am forced to speculate what actions had caused her such obvious worry and what fate awaited her as she disappeared into her torment. Was it work-related or something more personal? In my mind, top of the list of possibilities is something inappropriate at work in a work email, maybe writing something problematic and sending it to the named person instead of the intended recipient. Something meant for a colleague describing a lucrative client as a self-obsessed wankstain who almost certainly is bitter because they have a maggot-sized penis. Or a private email to a friend describing her boss as Hitler on acid. Of course, Texting the wrong person is always embarrassing too. Maybe she had spoiled a huge surprise by texting Georgina when she meant to text Sarah. Georgina will be so surprised when her, that her dad has got her a car for her birthday. I bet the excitement will soon wear off when she finds out it didn't. It doesn't get up the slight. Getting up. A, oh, I'm gonna try again. You can tell I haven't read it before, can't you? <laughs> But the excitement will soon wear off when she finds out it can't get up a slight gradient without stalling and the MOT is fake. But there are many other possibilities which may be less likely but are still possible. Um, putting the parrot in the microwave. Killing the nice one out of the identical twins instead of the asshole who stole his mother's life savings. Buying a coffee from Starbucks. Putting too much arsenic in a partner's food, thus making it obvious that foul play was at work. I guess I'll just have to keep an eye on the news and hope it wasn't something boring enough to forever remain a mystery. I wouldn't think it good for her health to be stressing so much over something trivial. Thank you. Uh, I can always count on that. <laughs> I just, I just, me too. Me too. <laughs> I can always count on you so good. to bring the levity on things that are serious, but I know. You're like, you're I know, like, and that's what I was talking about Laura as well, is because the way Laura was a wee, wee minx and sort of twisted things that were quite tragic with a sort of thumb in her snoot. <laughs> I mean, it, uh, it was actually the case that she she was talking. I mean, that bit was true. She was talking on the phone, and then she suddenly gone, "Oh fucking hell, what have I done?" 
oh fucking hell, I didn't mean to do that. And she kept saying it over and over again for possibly 15 minutes. Uh, and she was still on the phone and muttering when, when she left the train. <laughs> and I would have loved to have known what she'd done. I really would. But, you know, I, I have a feeling that it probably isn't as funny when it's happening, but the way you tell it, it is. It's yeah. Funny. The man has a talent. The yeah. man has a talent. For but that's the, you know, it's like, you know, Richard Spisak when he writes his poetry and using humor, because it's one of the best ways to, to sometimes deal with serious topics is to be able to infuse humor. So well, well done. That was beautiful. And thank you for that, because, you know, it's funny. I was just going to say, I, I know these open mic shows go a long time. And I, I'm hoping us poets are bringing back a sense of not just empathy, but a patience being able to sit for long periods of time like we used to, or maybe we, were, we romanticized the past when we sat for hours and talked and debate. But I, I just want to say thank you. And I'm grateful that for so, look how many have stuck it out and are here for each other. So I just wanted to say that and that's why it was brilliant, uh, Clive, because that, that was just perfect timing the, the 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 levity that you brought so anyway let, let's just continue on because uh that was brilliant so i have uh teresa i'm gonna ask you to sit in the green room and i would like to call to the mic melissa um, thank you for having me um so i've got about my brother um i will um do it first then i'll explain a bit um, so this one's called My Kind of Company. Someone who has been around the block a few times at the swimming pool, swimming in the pool lanes, running down the wing or, not, or along by the roadside, kicking the football into the goal or knocking it wide. You climbed the tree showing that you were not scared to do. You were held on the, to the branches above when they went below you. The bike ride, the escape to the park, to name a few, being ourselves with no care in the world, just us two. Catching it up with each other whenever we can talk or chat. He's scaring you when I tried to get rid of the cat. Mad haircuts or was I really the mad barber from hell? I love playing you up. I hope you can never tell. Don't get me wrong. We did have, have our moments, I'm sure, when things got all right and we both pulled through a door. I tried knocking you out with a single cat breeze cream egg. It didn't work out, especially when you broke your leg. We had some good times, especially when we went away. We went to Amsterdam and we went to Spain in May. We went for your birthday and stayed longer for mine. Some of the big holidays that we had together were fine. Um, one of the things, so my brother hasn't accepted my transition. And um, so that's kind of written about five, six years ago. So it was kind of, it's kind of a, a very emotive um, topic for me. I'm just going to leave you with one um, short one about the man. Um, the man looked after me when I was young. He drove me to and from many different places. He cooked me dinner every time I stayed around. He introduced me to loads of different faces. The man sometimes comes to the family home. He brought over other people with him too. He sometimes took me back to his bungalow just to escape the evil clutches of you. The man babies sat me when I was, wasn't was feeling well. He knew what, what I needed and knew what was wrong. He cheered me up and made me laugh out loud. Spending time with the man was never really long. The man is not the person that he once was. He is dying and holding on for as long as he can. The day it happens will make me cry, as I will only have the memory of the beloved, beloved man. And that one was about my granddad. Thank you. See, I almost forgot to unmute myself. Thank you so much, uh, Melissa. Thank you for sharing your story and, and your courage and your vulnerability. Appreciate it. So thank you. Okay, so I would like to ask Joanne to sit in the green room while we call to the mic, Therese. Thank you. Laura was great. Everybody's been so, so good. It's been a pleasure. Um, I have two very short poems and two short medium poems. The first two are dedicated to Flannery O'Connor. Some people have heard it. First is a haiku. Irresistible reality. Work out the layers of meaninglessness, hollowing through to desire. 
irresistible reality. Work out the layers of meaninglessness hollowing through to desire. And the second one is immortality. Do you know when you're hanging festive lights bright at Christmas tide, and when children sing carols, they bring reminders of death? And this is called. Uh, we saw the emptying, it's accompanying those with HIV AIDS. As it came sometimes in a flash or like a splash of rain, the pain entered and every crevice filled, striking fear knowing now the dying well, the dying was very near. You pushed it back with walls of courage, joy sprang up in unexpected ways, as every day you tried with friends collapsing at your side. It wasn't an acute trauma you transcended, but acute and chronic, and transcendence depended on your surrender to a power that ended our usual ways of coping. There was no hoping in the ordinary, and the great surprise was now you could touch my face and I yours, all because the defenses and codes fell apart. Now together, as you made a start towards heaven and the everlasting communion, gliding on the energy of love provided, it was effortless, a bit hard to surrender the body, but you knew the shell of our humanity must be shed for the passion of a life of love ahead. Now, through it all, I am not bereft, but the receiver of the gifts you left. And the second one is, we are not alone. This is short. Just as the heart of prayer gathers our ascent in that love present everywhere, music transcends. We are propelled above the limits of words and share an all-embracing unity with one another. Music sets us free. You see, this is the work of life, to integrate our body, mind, and spirit within the melody of love where splendor runs and restores every break and every fold like molten gold. The trail of song provides an everlasting space to move our bodies with the grace of unity. Coltrane touched this fire of creativity just as Mozart or Amy Winehouse and the amazing Miss D. It's in us to create and perform, whether ancient drummers crossing the miles with news or the bagpipers filling the space with song to gather their courage to lead the others into war. The songs of the bereaved from the Irish oppressed in their land or the gospel music making clear who is really in command in the deviant pathology of race. Music helped us to gather our strength with a larger vision which replaced the prison of despair. We sang to one another, love is everywhere. From the simple happy birthday song to our nation's anthems claiming the space where we belong, from monastic chants to Broadway rant, music lives and shapes our lives. It soothes, inspires, and makes us laugh. It marks the seasons, transcends our reason. Yes, every note that is intoned is telling us we are not alone. Listen, listen for the own. Listen for the own. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Teresa. Always good to hear you. Always good to hear your words. All right, um, I will ask uh, Ange to stand by because I'm not seeing this person, but I just want to call. Is uh, Joanne here? Joanne James, because I don't see uh, going once, twice, okay. All right, I'd like to call to the mic. Um, well, before I call to the mic, I'd like to have Mona stand by and I'd like to call Angie to the mic. Hello, everyone. Uh, I think I've read this one before, not sure, but it's a dramatization of the Proverbs 18.21, where the tongue uh, speaks life and death. Woke up one morning and the tongue was mad. Don't know why, but it was bad. Could have been something that happened yesterday. Could have been a week or so ago. One thing was for sure, the tongue was cut, throat, chainsaw, Wood chipper mad. She tried to slice him with the double edged uh, sword. Flash right, flash left. Head roll everywhere. Up here, round here, down the corner of the house was destroyed. It was a house divided, split in half, and split some more. It was Humpty Dumpty broke. Tom just looked and walked away. She knew there was nothing she could say. 
I asked her why. She simply said, I lost my head. And this next one is a tribute to my hometown. We home Alabama. Hometown blue. Muddy street, love that red mud under my feet and between my toes. Love the morning sun, it holds me in its arms. Love the smell of the summer rain, it energizes my brain. The glistening of the dew on the budding roses releases its hypnotic power. My hometown blues finally went away. Look like that looks like the red mud between my toes and under my feet are here to stay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Ange. Good to hear you as usual. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank up you. next. Um, before Mona gets to the mic, uh, June, you're in the you're standing by, and Mona, I'm calling Mona to the mic. Thank you, Roll, and thank you, Laura, for your set. Um, wonderful trip to Italy. Thank you. Um, so I picked something to read that's also kind of like a journal of a travel, but not really. <laughs> Much smaller. Hi, Bon. The winding road through the cathed cathedral of green has come to an end. The little cemetery by the wayside with its white stones and plastic flowers is an unexpected splash of color on this cloudy day. It is midsummer and finally the tormenting heat just a dream away. I set down my gear by the lake, the paddle, the camera, the water. In a chair, serene and friendly, an old lady looks at me intently. She tells me she never had the courage to venture on the water, but seeing my gear there all laid out, she'd like to try. I encourage her as best I can. It is easier than you think, I say, and I set out as I always do onto the quiet waters, into the distance. I reach the lily pond, the first waves, wave of lily blossom and gone as days crept into the summer. Now, as far as one can see, the paths stretch in a symphony of tones, nuances, greens, reds, yellows. The second movement of this aquatic opus announced by a tiny bud, now white, now yellow. Every now and then my eyes reach the shore, the wildflowers wild with summer are lush and glorious and alive. Here I am at the turn of the day. I think of the winding road, the forest, the white old chapel, the bells, the stones, and the plastic flowers. I paddle along the lily pond, proclaims its second coming. And the haiku that goes with this uh, narrative, uh, midsummer twilight, empty lily pads await the second coming. Midsummer twilight, empty lily pads await the second coming. Thank you all. And thanks, Laura and Raul. Thank you, Mona. Thank you. Thank you. Treat to hear you as always, as always. All right. We're getting close to the end, guys. We're getting close to the end. So, you know, speaks to our intestinal fortitude, our strength, our durability, our love, our patience. Keep adding stuff to it. So, all right. I don't see June here, but just out of courtesy, are you here, June? Yes, I am. Oh, okay. That's why I wanted to call because I don't know all the handles. So you have the mic, my friend, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Richard, you're on deck. So please share with us, June. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. And um, I agree. Thank you for sticking with it. Um, I'm very, very happy to be a part of this. And Laura, thank you so much for the wonderful set. And thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm going to read a poem from a chapbook 
of mine called Hearts, Poems of Love. And the poem is called The Four TVs of Sharice and Izzy. Sometimes uh, love is unfortunately mixed with abuse. Izzy. The light in the room came from four TVs. Flat screens played all at once like Sears. Izzy loved Sears. His undershirt, white, white, lit up and glowing fluorescent like a tech moon when the commercials came on. Izzy loved commercials. His everyday uniform, blue. Every day, still, the twills tucked everything into those big cotton work pants. Izzy had loved work. Six each day or more, the kitchen door would open, uploading chips and beer and sandwich, and maybe more beer appearing. Izzy loved beer. Years like this, years of the ashtrays becoming performance sculpture, movable parts of a coffee table schematic with cigarettes, a pivotal role. Izzy loved cigarettes. Disgust and disappointment, his style of fashion color, gray hair and skin melding with no particular effort, reluctantly leaving the TVs to wash daily at 3 p.m. with no particular effort. Izzy hated effort. The father's grandfather clock was never fixed. It would be time for dinner soon, guessing, his mind semi-frozen to the day he was no longer needed at Sears or anywhere, really, he thought, as he did not like to think. Charisse. The bruise on her left cheek was almost gone. Checking her reflection in the kitchen window, she was almost sure she was excited. Recognized by the extra pepper on the pepper steak, she noticed and the fresh, fresh garlic on the day old garlic bread. Kitchen smells excited, the energy of which inspired Charisse. She proceeded to extra add more fresh things, to hum things, humdrum and plain from a can things, began to sink with tomatoes and onions and desires. Charisse adding more noodles to the noodles spilling on the apron she had just made yesterday or the day before, she was the wife and she was completely sure she was excited. The bruise on her right arm was fading. She could wear sleeveless soon and she would. The last time Izzy licked plate was 1998 when he liked something. Cherise knew he would like this. He just wouldn't say. The bruise on her shoulder was almost undetectable. Hell, she might even go strapless soon and she would too for the visit. There were four TVs in the room for living where Izzy negotiated the dark, keeping volume and stations the same like Sears. Charisse kept his undershirts white, white, the same as when he was at Sears. She was so sure she was excited. It had been so long since she was Charisse, smiling for no reason. Dishes done and Izzy in a TV snooze, she left. Not looking back behind her as the pavement moved on its own, like in the airport, she flew to the visit, wishing she could stay. Stay there all the time, wrapped in kindness and attention, watching worries fade along with bruises and sunsets, dizzy, dizzy with pleasure. She was absolutely sure now that she was really excited. The circumstances of the visit were in line all four TVs would still be on at home and Izzy would be asleep. Izzy loved to sleep. Thank you so much. The next poem is called, We Were Almost Evicted. Hmm. And uh, unfortunately it's based on true events. Um, and I, I wrote it also because I'm in Arizona and the incidence of eviction is extremely high in Phoenix, in Phoenix compared to um, the rest of the country. There's a memory of a rental, a memory of the Jenkintown house with a salmon pink rug 
with the bugs in the pile, with the windows, our only air, with the sleeping on the floor, on that rug, with the kitchen, small, but equipped with the basics for sandwiches and lasagna on Sundays, with the mouse running through the lasagna just as I was about to serve it, with the greens and the utensils, with the decision now to be made when I stopped crying, do we throw it all away or pray over it and eat it anyway? With the Lord on our side, I don't see why not, but with the devil in the way, we throw it away with the hope of a decent dinner and a real existence to prove to ourselves we counted. We mattered with the owner at the door and the notice given ages ago. I didn't know mom bought a new house with the divorce money and the exams I had to study for. I was tied up packing with the two of them gone for the weekend, not answering the phone. Hunt down, finally get through, and me alone here to sort out with the anger in my chest and the how could she not in my stomach with the shame on my tongue. I packed it all while she called for help and pulled nails out of the wall where her picture used to be and the other two laughed and played with the clothes instead of packing them with the rest of the things that had to be out by Monday with the final notice given with the tone in the voice and it's Sunday morning and the Lord watching and the angels helping us pack with their hands and wings at the same time with the decisions and the new keys on the kitchen counter with the pea soup and a sandwich which she ate which mom ate before a nap and then after staring with the inquisitive eye wondering why I was so upset with the family and me deciding this is the last time with the moving with the sharing spaces with the shocks that roll roll you into a gutter and leave you to crawl out on your own in the midst of something big like life with the answers raining all around you that you just can't see. <clears throat> Brilliant work, Ju. Thank Brilliant you. Work. Thank you so much. Thank work you for having me. Oh, you're most welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Laura, for inviting her. I mean, your 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 work is stuff that we can all relate to. It's, it's so it's so personable. I mean, whether you've been evicted or not, you've been asked to leave places where you've wanted to, and then you had to go. So, mm -hmm. yep. Yes. So I love that thing from one head. <laughs> what was and, that, Joan? Sorry. Oh, sorry just like, I says I've been evicted from my own head. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and someone that that there is a poem. I'm not making light of it because I've also been in situations of what you've been in before. But see, just to take it further and to use language further than that, but sure, that I absolutely loved it. By the way, see the way you spoke your poetry like that, like a rat a tat a tat a tat. I absolutely loved the way you spoke your poetry. I really did. Thank I you like so much. About, about, about of um their own personality rhythm beat. Um and boy man, you're just you're just scuffed with beats. Well, it's the <laughs> first time I'm hearing you, June, yeah. and I really enjoyed it. So I, I definitely look forward to to hearing it. Definitely. I'm definitely looking forward Thank to you. it. Thank you. Thank you both. I mean, so... you see, this is why we, you know, these shows last so long because sometimes it, you know you have to share when you hear something that that that, that's oh, I couldn't cool. resist. I couldn't resist that one. I just loved it so much. Just no. loved the way it was spoken. I'm with you. I'm with you too. So, but we are getting close to the end. So I appreciate it. So, uh, we all know this this young man. So I'm gonna ask uh, Keith. You're in the waiting room and up to the mic, Richard Spisak. Thank you, my friends. Uh, brilliant, yeah. all of you. Just amazing, Laura. Splendid feature, my dear. Your work is always so enjoyable. Uh, poignant, heartfelt, uh, just amazing. And I have two for you. Uh, and in a galactic sense, these are both very short. 
This first one is called Tree Huggers. And I want you all to be championship tree huggers, okay? So here we go. Champion tree huggers. Now you may not know this, but around the world, many nations hold tree hugging championships. And this is a little few thoughts about that. The noble upright stalk, the bark protects the delicate core, the miracle of both concealed and revealed roots. The lush living canopy, like so many hungry flags, buoyed on the living air, give us sustenance of fruit, of shade, of beauty, grant us peace and pleasure. The generous shade, the sweet, powerful nuts, the generous fruit, the sharp, pungent needles, how we cling through and with your strength, how we're made stable by your unbending height, how we're taught by your flexibility in the mad merry winds of time that you shelter us, we are stronger, that you feed us, we give thanks, that you stand through night and storm, we too are proud, and that when you fall, you yet nourish those around you. We gain grace and eternity. Another champion tree hugger. Be a championship tree hugger. Okay? And then I'm going to leave this up because I, I want you to think about that. But this is a, a love poem. And it's a love poem that that is to those who are far away. And I think you'll You'll appreciate the little, the little felt here. It's called, If You Were in Oslo. If you were in Oslo, I wouldn't wait. I wouldn't go slow. If you were in Vienna, I would rush to see you. If you were in Madrid, let me tell you, kid, if you were in Rome, I'd make you feel at home. If you were in Bern, that's all I'd have to learn. But if you were in Shanghai, I would never ask you why. If you were in Johannesburg, I'd tell you all the things I heard. If you were in Singapore, quick as an email, I'd be at your door. If you were in Rio, I'd be so very glad to see you. If you were in Vladivostok, I'd let you pull my stockings off. If you were in Minsk, you'd really be convinced. If you were in Marseille, I'd say all there is to say. If you rested in Beirut, I'd demand you ply your suit. But if in Dubai, you'd never need to ask me why. If you were in Shannon, I'd be there like a cannon. But no matter where, it's in the heart. That's where it starts. Thank you, my friends. I'm going to mention my old teacher and say, be here now. Thank you, my friends. You Thank know, you. just just when I don't think you can uh, top yourself, you top yourself. So I love that last piece, Richard. Love that last piece. I don't think I've heard it before, but I love it. Love it. Have I said I loved it? <laughs> well done, Richard. Thank you, brother. Well done, Richard. Well done. This young man I have not heard in a while, so I'm going to ask <laughs> our last poet, Henry, to sit in the green room and take in this last, this last poet before him. So, Keith, the mic is yours, my friend. It's been a while. Yes, it has. It's really nice to be back. I actually have been... It's it's nice to be back among the living. I have not been coming to open mics for a while. So this is the first time, and I'm glad that I did it here. And actually, uh, if Laura hadn't sent me an invite, I wouldn't have known that it was actually happening or that anything was happening. So here I am. Uh, so I'm going to share something that started with waking up at 4 a.m. in the morning. And each time that I did, a dream slash memory came back to me of something that actually happened that I was so uncomfortable with and actually felt so ashamed of that I would push it back into my unconscious where it would recycle. Sometimes it would take a year, sometimes two but would show up again and say, hey, buddy, here I am. I'm not going away. 
if you ever want to be whole, you need to write this down. So finally, I said, yes, okay, I'll write it down. And then the voice said, oh, okay, that's fine. But now you have to, you have to read it in front of people. <laughs> I have a very bossy inner voice. Anyway, this, when the dust settled, this is the piece. And it's called Erasure. I am in agony. I am seven years old. My class at my almost all white grade school in Fresno, California must draw a self portrait. I am in agony. I can't finish my drawing. Each time I draw my face, I erase, I start over. I draw my face again and erase again. I am filled with shame at what I see, for what I see staring back at me is my Chinese face. You see, when the Gestapo boots of every kid in the Ching Chong Chinaman parade goose steps on a tender young throat, it grinds a lasting heel print, a black and blue bruise of self-hate. And it was my Chinese eyes I felt the most ashamed of. They say, they say the eyes are a mirror to the soul and like a mirror, they reflect the person looking into them. Did the kids mock my eyes without seeing their own cruelty? Does Donald mock others without seeing his own reflection? Today, we turn a blind eye to the immense power of a tongue wielded like a scythe that lacerates the heart with words that maim. Shame and humiliation. I didn't know those were the words for the feelings I had. What I did know was I felt a hot flush in my face when I looked at the face I had drawn. Before I quickly erased it, what I did know was that I covered it up when anybody walked by. What I did know was I didn't want to face my face, this face of mine I so wished I could replace, this face of mine, the source of my disgrace. In the end, the drawing I turned in had the eyes and face of a little white boy you see, after all that erasing, I had erased myself. And what I want to tell you and what I didn't realize was I was erasing so much more than my face that day. I was erasing the beauty of who I was. I was erasing my history, my culture. I was erasing my love of my mother's Chinese cooking. I was erasing my appreciation, my appreciation for my hardworking father who didn't look like the heroes in the movies. I despaired that we could ever be the heroes in our own stories. I was erasing my desire to be and share who I was. And what I want to tell you, this was just the beginning of my complete erasure, the beginning of a lifelong struggle to love myself as I am, to love my rich golden amber honey butter skin, to love myself with this face, this face I once saw in a museum atop a proud terracotta warrior and to love myself with these eyes, my beautiful obsidian eyes that tell the tale of my ancestors. If you only look deeply enough into them. This is a story 
I would remember and forget for years when all at once my story shook me, rocked me, cradled me in its arms and whispered, my sweet boy, this time it's safe to listen. This story is an old friend pointing to where my healing lies. I know now this shame isn't something I was meant to keep. We are not meant to stay wounded. We were meant to be poems across the sky. I release my shame into the wind. I stand strong and proud. I look the world square in the eye with these eyes. I never told my story to anyone. My story insists I tell all of you now. Thank you for listening, guys and women. Once again, I forgot to unmute. Thank you so much, Keith. Thank you for for sharing, being vulnerable and sharing, uh, you know, painful, painful memories. Because that was intense. Poetry, we are poems, and all our lives and our experiences are poems waiting to happen. And it, it's good therapy, so appreciate it. And it, it, it takes, takes tremendous courage to share. So thank you, my friend. Thank you. All right. And oh, then there was... Oh, oh. Did anybody feel... Uh, sorry for interrupting. I'm really sorry for interrupting. But does anybody feel um, when someone's in pain in a poem... Do you feel that you're scooting round about them to hold them? Because yes. when I was listening, when yeah. I was listening to you, I was scooting around <clears throat> about you in cyberspace to hold you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I want to reach through the screen sometimes yeah. and yeah. hold people. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was. That's what I was. That that's what I mean. I, the connections, even although it's in it's through cyberspace they're really quite amazing connections when people are as vulnerable as you and can come out with such raw emotion the way you do it's it's so whoa it is it really connects and wonderful stuff well, absolutely wonderful poetry yeah, thank you I, I go between wanting thank you. i go between wanting to express compassion and recognizing what dumbasses are you know, this whole question of color coding or nationality is like so boring and you know i i just think it's great that you can bring to voice what kids experience in isolation you know because it, yeah. it still goes on you know it's disgusting can i say that on top of this i i live with a, a an illness called agoraphobia so mm -hmm. i can't get out to open my nights that's hard. It yeah. comes and it, it comes and it goes, and at the moment it's pretty bad, and so this to me is joy. Yeah, you know, to hear other poets, to yeah. see different people, and I'm really sorry if I sent you a pa a, a painting that I shouldn't have done. Were you talking? To, somebody says where are people getting the backdrops? Was that was that what someone was asking? Anyway, somebody so asked where. John, can I invite you to to maybe reach out to Keith and 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 talk about this more directly. Um, I, ju I just want to honor the it's fact. Actually, I don't know who said it. It wasn't Keith because he was speaking. Somebody asked about the back door. Oh, someone, I didn't so know. Okay, anyway. That's yeah, why just, I wanna, just we're almost, people like mad. That's why I did it. Yep, no, not a problem. It's just that we're almost done and, and it, it's, been a, it's been a very long show. I mean, that's the beauty of poetry. Poetry brings up a lot of things. And this is why I always invite people to, to don't just talk at these open mics, reach out to people and get to know them and understand, you know, what their walk is. The more we understand each other, the more we see a lot of ourselves in each other's walks. Because we, we like to think we're so different. We, we go through the same things. We just experience it differently. So <laughs> this is why it's important. It's true. Anyway, we have one left, uh, and uh, I always appreciate the person that gets to, to bring us home from a poetic standpoint. So I'd like to call Henry to the mic, my friend. Hello, everyone. This has been a marvelous day. Laura, oh my God, yes. I, I knew I couldn't miss this. And 
so much has been going on. And when I saw that there was going to be, you were going to be the feature, I said, I, I must be there no matter what. Even if I didn't have a chance to read, I was going to be here because it's not necessary for me to read all the time. Today, I'm going to end this day with a poem titled, I'm a Cup of Coffee. I've read this at some other places. I'm a coffee lover. I'm a coffee addict. I'm not a coffee lover. I'm going to be honest. I'm a coffee addict. I need my coffee. Uh, I'm not an evil coffee addict where if I haven't had my coffee, I'll bite your head off, but just let me have my start of the day. Here we go. I'm a cup of coffee. I'm a fragile being, a cup, soul trapped in flesh and bones, coffee stains left inside me, a vessel, a chipped cup with streaking hairline cracks, barely holding it together, etched scratches made with an orphan spoon, unmatched to other flatware, has a slightly twisted handle bent from a psychic's mind trip. This metal spatula scrapes my insides and touches my skin like a lover's tongue, seeking and craving to release what's trapped inside. Hidden frustrations blocking smiles, forsaken passion to awaken me again. I pour in sugar and swirl it down the black hole. Here comes the bitter river flowing from the past, each hungry taste drinking new hope, my tongue baptized with silent praises. But each and every morning, I find a way to keep going, lift the blues while sipping and watching the TV news, drink from a wasteland of fear, becoming what's drank, callous feet hardened by the negative images, walking and fighting who and what I am. Long bloodlines of blackness, crush remains of blackness, brewed and renewed blackness, sipping with patience alone, but awaiting phantom lips. Those salty lips kiss me. I'm on the edge again, catch tears and swallow them. The salt removes the bitterness swirling in this cup of Java joy, creates a calm, mocking Zen desires between the walled remains. This well echoing silence, I close my eyes to remember the smell of brewed mountain beans into liquefied and glorified lava flows to familiar trails and roads until night where I walk to become lost and found, washing away my sorrow and a gentle rain spritzing mist or a thunderstorm soaking clothes. By morning, both leave sacred dew and a lingering aroma in this cup. My voice still asleep, though I'm awake, drinking to remember, sitting here wanting to connect with those gathered beings, roasted, beaten, and crushed, then drowned in tears, poured onto the leaf, poured from the leaves. Now my reflection floats, showing me another way and day. Clairvoyant mirror of prophecy, too frightened to look or believe. One second. <clears throat> too frightened to look and believe the third eye images cast from the wind of smoky lucid nightmares swirling passages cast away into a bonfire but i dare not reach inside the fire i'm the kindling and the flames but heated to crack the porcelain cup forming deeply glazed stains where captured hope leeches into the walls as unwashable images. Nothing can clean, feeling dirty, unworthy, but I am the blackness layered to bruise, to brew inside and outside, to sip and remember the early morning, wondering what the new day will bring. Coffee which finds and makes a way, long thirsty generations to be me and this porcelain well to become me. I am a fragile being, 
a cup, soul trapped in flesh and bones, coffee stains left inside me. What a fitting way to, excuse me, end the show. Because Henry is next month's feature. So you got you got a little taste of what next month's feature will be. The brilliant Is your, your man your next month's feature? Pardon, say that again, Joan. Is your man there the next 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 month's feature? Yes, Henry is wow. next month's feature. So hopefully you'll uh you'll uh you'll be able to I'm never going to be able to drink coffee without thinking of him now, that's it. <laughs> Well, maybe that's no, why that's I drink. Cool. I, you know, I drink coffee all day long. I used to drink it all day long, so you know, I never, I you never thought of uh, the way he he used, you know, the phrasing of uh, you know having a cup of coffee is like you know sitting there anticipating the coming day. So I've been doing that because I drink coffee all day. So each cup of coffee is me anticipating the coming day. It's just brilliant writing. So. If you want to uh, to to experience more, come back because that's just a little sampling of what you'll experience next month hearing Henry. Yeah. Right, but anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that is the, that is the end of the open mic. That is the end of Gustav op uh, open mic. Um, I want to say thank, thank you, you so much to to Laura for such an amazing, heartfelt trip through Europe with you and your family. That's what it felt like. I felt like we all went on a European vacation with you and your family, except it wasn't a comedy. Well, there were some comedic moments, but it was life. <laughs> it was a sampling of your life, of yours and your and your husband, of 30 years with you and your kids. So I'm just grateful to be able to, to do this for Amy today. And also, you know, Amy, thank you for, for creating this space. We, we we had an amazing group of poets with Amy herself and Suzanne and Mare and, and Millie and Finn, Ian, Nina, Joan, Neymar, Richard, Harris, I have to remember to say the two, Leslie, Ike, Clive, Melissa, Therese, Angie, Mona, June, Richard Spisak, Keith, and Henry. It's been quite... Yeah, you created a name poem there. Sorry? You ended on a name poem there. I did I. But, uh, I just wanted to say thank you because I mean it's 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 these are longer shows, but I I I myself like in my shows I do not make apologies for long shows. Oh. I actually just invite us to remember that we can gather and sit in long periods of time and share. Um, it's not just Wait. about the five minutes that people Excuse are waiting me. for. So. I just want to say thank you. Uh, Amy, you want to say anything before we, we wrap it up? Or, you know, it is your show. So I know you're a little drained. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you, Raul and Laura, so much for all that you've done to take on the show. I think my connection is unstable. All right. Can you see that? And um, It's unstable. No, you're really clear. You're clear right now. I'm yes. good. Okay. It keeps telling me. Okay. <laughs> Well, I just am so appreciative and I just feel so grateful for this show. And this today was so beautiful and powerful, inspiring. I learned so much and I just appreciate all of you being here. Thank you. And so. I loved your poem. Thank you. Oh, so, thank you. Uh, I will, uh, I, will uh, un, 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 I will end the show. The show has ended and say thank you so much once again. Appreciate all of you. Keep writing. Uh, I myself personally don't care if I agree with your viewpoints on, on life. I want to hear what you have to say. I invite yeah. you to write. I invite us not just to write, but to find ways to connect, to share our thoughts, share yeah. our ideas. Small minds gossip. Great and connected minds talk ideas, even when they disagree. We do not have to agree on everything, but it's important that we speak with respect and like yeah. i said earlier when i think it was june whoever uh, read the poem we really want to end racism mm -hmm. stop believing in race it's done exactly it's no, exactly. it not no, truth anymore just like a lot of things that we believe in it's not truth anymore so mm -hmm. it's important for us poets to be balanced to invite conversations mm -hmm. 
because with social media, we are now part of the Florida State. We are now media. So I invite us to take that seriously. Keep writing, keep sharing, keep talking, and keep Definitely. hugging trees. Hug a tree, hug a poet. Hug a <laughs> I love you all, Laura. <laughs> fantastic job. Oh, fantastic. You I enjoyed this. Thank you. Give me, I'll, I'll get this so to much. you as soon as it can. Bye, bye. Thank you so much, people. I love I appreciate you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Love you guys. Take care. Bye, Thank, you. Thank you.